Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar for the uh, FACES team. My name is Habiba and I'm going to facilitate the meeting today. FACES is the acronym for Friends Advancing Careers Through E-Based Learning. It is the first webinar delivered from the new AAAPC subcommittee and probably the last webinar for this year. I welcome our speaker, Dr. Chris Burton, who is going to talk to us about informal academic networks, developmental networks, and social capital, the essentials for early career researchers in academic primary care. Dr. Burton is a senior lecturer in the Department of General Practice at Monash University in Melbourne, Victoria. He completed his PhD in epidemiology at Monash University in 2005 then completed postdoctoral research training in primary healthcare research at the University of Adelaide. Welcome everyone who just joined. So I was introducing Dr. Burton. So he did his PhD from Monash University back in 2005. And um, after a period of working as a research fellow on grant funded research projects, he gained a continuing position in the School of Health Science at Flinders University, where he worked from 2011 to 2017. During this time, he provided leadership in research training in health science. He was involved in course coordination of honors and was chair of research higher degrees in uh, 2014 and 2015. He joined the Department of General Practice, Monash University in August 2017, and he provided leadership to the department's research training programs, including vacation scholars, honors, PhD, and academic post registers. In 2021, very recently, he was the recipient of Dean's Award for Industry Engagement in Education for his role in the delivery of a highly successful research training activity package for the RCGP uh, to the academic post registrars. And uh, I'm extremely lucky to be one of the academic registrars who got the opportunity to be part of the teaching program uh, that is conducted by Chris. It is very organized and inspirational education program for the new registrars and also the new researchers. He is an associate editor for the BMC family practice and recently completed a term as a treasurer for Triple APC executive team. Mm. So I welcome Chris to talk to us. Mm. Uh, thanks so much, Hibiba. And uh, welcome everybody. It's uh, great to be able to um, chat with you. Um, I, uh, I, I think it's fantastic that, that Triple APC has um, uh, has uh, has um, uh, has has kind of enabled um, this uh, this group and uh, and providing the support for uh, for early career researchers. Given that, uh, that we're kind of scattered all around the country, and you know, it can be quite hard as an early career researcher to kind of get around to meetings and and particularly uh, travel in state, especially at the moment. Um, yeah, having opportunities like this um, that they've organised to be there is, uh, is is really really great. Um, I will quickly share my screen. Uh, now, if anyone was hoping that I was going to talk about social media and Twitter and LinkedIn or anything like that, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to disappoint you. Um, I'm, I'm talking about uh, uh, nothing, nothing, not much online. It's it's all about face-to-face um, uh, -face relationships and uh, and um, social networks in the uh, in, in the context of of human relations. Um, and just as people come in, we'll just get to everyone just to, to turn off their, uh, uh, just to mute their microphones. Um, as we go along, there's going to be some time, uh, some chances to uh, to have a chat. Um, and uh, and I've got some uh, some some activities for you to do as well to to kind of help um, have a think about how we can use some of these concepts to uh, to, to help you as you you progress through your careers and 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 uh, and the next stage of your careers. So okay. Uh, let's have a look. Okay, so uh, <laughs> part of the talk, at least, is inspired by um, by this uh, uh, this um, uh, note, which was actually um, uh, pinned in the uh, the tea room, actually at Flinders University. We were just talking about Flinders University beforehand, and uh, a guide to academic relationships. Um, you know, same department, different field colleague, and uh, and so on, and and so the, the the talk today is really focused on these uh, these top three. 
um, uh, relationships, um, colleagues, collaborators, and, uh, and, and conference buddies. But I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a relational perspective, um, and uh, and particularly as it applies to, uh, to to my research and and my teaching and um, and the program coordination that that um, that I've had the chance to do over the last few years. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about social networks and developmental networks and social capital, and and in particular how they work in academia and and how you can um, how you can kind of uh, harness them to to help as you uh, help help with your career development. Um, and, and also with your well-being um, and, uh, and then achieving impact um, outside of uh, um, or from your research, achieving impact from your research with, with external stakeholders and, and uh, industry groups. And then I'll, I'll, I'll add in a couple of slides around COVID-19 and, and working from home, um, just have a, a chance to kind of reflect on some of the experiences of that. Um, I'm, I'm based in Melbourne, um, obviously, and, uh, and I, I guess our experience across the country has been, been quite different. Um, we've uh, just come out on, of, a, of a, quite a, a long lockdown period um, and a very strict lockdown period uh, here, in, uh, here in Melbourne. And um, um, uh, so I guess people's perspectives will be different, but uh, I've just got some reflections on, uh, on that as, as well. And then woven throughout, um, I, I've got some strategies to, to help you build your networks and, uh, and make the most of, uh, of social capital to, uh, to, to support you in your, uh, your careers. Um, so just very quickly, just uh, just my beginnings and, and and my perspective. This is a photo of me back when I was doing my PhD, um, which was at, at Monash Uni, the Department of Epidemiology and Preventive Medicine. I kind of aging, or dating myself by the the corded telephone and the big CRT monitor uh, on my computer. But yeah, at least there's a computer on the desk. Um, um, but uh, look, I had a great time as a, a PhD student. I was, I was really fortunate to have a terrific supervisory team. Um, and um, and uh, and uh, exposed to a, a really high performance research culture, um, which um, which is uh, I've been able to take a lot of learnings from and uh, and and try to apply those in the uh, the the the, um, the settings that um, uh, and and the programs that uh, that I've run um, as a uh, as an academic. Um, so I'm a, I, I guess, a science background. Um, I majored in physiology and psychology at uh, Uni of Adelaide, and um, and so I was uh, really interested in the kind of connection between mind and body um, fairly early on. And um, and I actually I enrolled in honours in physiology, but um, um, it's a little bit embarrassing because I actually coordinate an honours program here at, at Monash, but I, I never actually finished honours. Um, but I uh, it, it got up, it actually got upgraded. I didn't kind of didn't flunk out of it or anything like that, but uh, it actually got upgraded mostly because the project was taking too long. Um, it was more of a two year project rather than a one year project. Um, but uh, so I completed a master's of medical science, um, and uh, and I was um. I was looking at, uh, we were trying to predict post-traumatic stress disorder and, um, and depression uh, from the hormonal response or the endocrine response to, uh, to acute trauma. And, uh, um, and so, that, uh, so that was at University of Adelaide as well. And uh, coming out of that, I was getting offered jobs in laboratories and, uh, and I, I got offered a job working on, a, uh, on, on an animal model of trauma. And it just, it just really didn't appeal to me, the, the lab side of things. Um, I was really interested more in, in people and working with uh, participants and study participants and learning about their lives and, and, uh, and, and, and how they live their lives. And uh, so when I went in to do my PhD, I was, I was looking at something that was more kind of person-centered. And, uh, and, uh, and so I moved across to Melbourne and, um, and enrolled in a PhD in, in epidemiology. And uh, my, um, my supervisor was a respiratory epidemiologist and, uh, and my PhD was looking at how um, caregivers cope with the stress of caring for a, a child with asthma. And, uh, and it was very much kind of focused on, even though it was in Department of Epidemiology, it was focused on uh, you know, things like coping styles and, uh, and, uh, and, and had underpinning it um, exploration and understanding the lived experience of caring for a child with, uh, with chronic illness. Um, one of the, th this book um, was really influential for me um, quite early on uh, in my PhD, probably in the first year of my PhD. Um, the, the first edition of this was, was published in, in 2000, um, so just after I started my PhD. And, um, and it, it really kind of social epidemiology has really kind of struck a chord with me. Um, and uh, it, it's something that, uh, that, um, uh, that, that I've really enjoyed um, being, a, being a part of. 
And um, so I guess socio-epidemiology is defined as, you know, the branch of epidemiology that studies the social distribution and social determinants of states of health. But within social epidemiology, there are, I, I guess, kind of subfields and subgenres. And, uh, and my interest has kind of increasingly been towards um, the role of social relationships and, um, and, and the kind of relational aspects um, of, uh, of, um, of, of living with chronic disease and, and how that impacts on management and, and effect as well. So how living with a chronic illness makes, uh, makes you feel. Um, the other really kind of influential book for me um, that I come across quite early in my career was, uh, was Promoting Health by uh, Andrea uh, Wass. And, um, and, uh, and she talks about, the, the prim about primary health care um, in, uh, in health promotion and a primary health care approach to health promotion. And, uh, and so I, I was really, really taken by that and just the... Um, yeah, you know, that just the, the power of of uh, primary healthcare to to uh, to, uh, to to impact and and uh, and make change um, or achieve change uh, in people's lives um, at a population level. And so, coming out of my PhD, um, I was really interested to uh, to get involved in primary care research and, and primary healthcare research, and uh, and so that's why I was was quite keen to take up the offer um, of a postdoc uh, in the Department of General Practice at at University of Adelaide. So, um, so underpinning, so as I was coming out of my PhD, um, I, was, I was getting really interested in um, uh, social kind of attempts of health and, and, um, and, and, and that's kind of continued on um, in, uh, in, in both my research and my teaching um, over the years. And, and um, I've really come to, to, um, to value and I, I guess lean on and, and look at kind of health problems um, from very much a relational lens. And so uh, a, a relational uh, approach or a relational lens has its you know, central premise that, um, that to be human is to be a social relational being. And, um, um, and yeah, the, the, the focus is on um, participation, shared experience, social connection, and, uh, and you know, to, to live is to be held in relationship regardless of the health of one body, one's body. And so connectedness and care are, are fundamental to human life. And, um, and so that, that kind of lens, I, I apply that lens in, in, in my research that I do, which is primarily around patient experience and lived experience um, with chronic illness um, and managing chronic illness, um, but also in, in the teaching I do um, as well, um, as I'll, I'll come to talk about later on. And um, yeah, as, as we've said, this, this is a, um, a, a photo from, uh, from our end of year event um, in the Department of General Practice here at Monash in, in 2019. That's Grant Russell, many of you will recognize Grant. Um, and uh, for those of you that, uh, that were there, um, the, the, the level of connection that was, a, was, a, was achieved over this strawberry plant, um, which, was a, uh, which was part of a Kris Kringle, um, uh, you know, it, was, it was really quite, quite important in our, in our department at, at the time. And uh, I know there's a couple of people on the call who are new members to the Department of General Practice, and uh, and hopefully in the next kind of year or so, um, you'll be able to, we'll be able to in, enjoy a, uh, a end of year event, um, and because they, they really are quite quite epic, um, and uh, not not to be missed. Um, so don't don't worry about reading too much of the text here. Um, I'll, I'll just kind of talk you through the, the the key things which I just want you to take from this slide, but. Um, so again, so th this relational lens has, uh, has been, as I said, really important in, in guiding the research that I do or underpinning the research that I do um, and also my teaching. Um, so this is just the, uh, a research statement which I, which I put into a lot of my you know, things like grant applications. It's on the website um, as well. And, uh, and just kind of emphasizing that you know, my, my research focus is that the relational and effective aspects of care um, and exploring issues such as doctor patient relationship, communication, attitude, stigma, and trust. And, uh, but um, yeah, more so than in, in, than, than in research, I mean, I mean, it's been very important in, in the research that I do, but um, I, I actually, and I, I didn't actually, I hadn't really thought about this too much until um, uh, Habibia actually invited me to. To, um, to, to give this talk, but that, that kind of relational approach has been really influential in the, the teaching that I, that I do as well. And um, this is a extract from my teaching philosophy statement. Um, so when you, um, when you, uh, when you have a, uh, when you kind of um, have a continuing position at uh, uh, universities, you, you need to do a, uh, um, 
a, uh, a introduction to, to teaching and uh, the one that I did was at Flinders, it was the Flinders Foundation of University Teaching and as part of that they, they make you or encourage well, they make you, you you have to put together a, a teaching philosophy statement and it's a really useful chance to kind of think back and think well what are the actual um, you know, values that I'm bringing to my teaching, what, what's, what, what are the principles that underpin the teaching that I do and so this was from 2011 when I, when I wrote this um, but uh, a lot of my teaching kind of draws on this, this concept of immediacy, um, which, is a, uh, which is a set of communicative behaviours that influence um, uh, the perception of physical and psych psychological closeness. Um, so it's about interpersonal relationships with students. Um, and, um, and it kind of has as, a, as part of its underpinning that, you know, this notion that you know, long-term hard persistent effort um, comes from the heart, not, not the head. Um, and, um, you know, encourage students and, and challenge students to do their best. And, but we do that by promoting a climate of, of caring and trust. And um, so it's very much a, a kind of a relational approach um, to teaching. Um, and uh, certainly I, I had to put this teaching philosophy statement together uh, in the, the context of the, uh, the topic that I was running at the time, which was a, a quantitative research methods topic. But, um, but I found myself, uh, as I was moving from kind of topic coordination through to program coordination, um, that the, this kind of relational approach to thinking about um, um, students and, and their learning um, has remained really, really important. Um, in 2014, 2015, I was the, uh, the chair of research high degrees at, uh, at Flinders in the School of Health Sciences. And uh, it was actually, it was just after the School of Health Sciences had been uh, split off or cleaved off from the, uh, from the, uh, the School of, of Medicine, and there was a School of Nursing as well. And, uh, and so we had, to, so I was putting together a, a new kind of research high degree program and, and included honours as well um, uh, in, in the brief. And uh, so I, I had to, so I spent quite a bit of time thinking about, well, what's the, the, the culture of research training that we want? Um, at Fat Flinders, as it was at the time, and and in and in our school, um, and uh, and and so this kind of relational um, uh, approach underpinned a lot of the, the, the values and the uh, the processes um, that we put in place for students um, at Flinders. Um, when I moved to uh, Monash in uh, in 2017, um, again one of the first things that um, that uh, that I was asked to do was to to think about and put together a plan to develop the research culture uh, in in the department um, here in uh, general practice at Monash, and uh, and so I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, a little bit more in detail in a, in a sec. But uh, again, having a, a kind of a social and relational underpinning to the the training that we provide to our our students here at Monash has been uh, been really important, and uh, and I think it's been really successful um, as well. So um, a, a couple of years ago, there was a really interesting uh, paper published. This was a realist synthesis um, that looked at the uh, at, at uh, research outcomes from a, a number of different diff a number of different disciplines, and uh, and the realist kind of synthesis identified context mechanisms and outcomes um, that were associated with successful research environments, and um, and so. Um, as, as you might, might guess, given the, the, the nature of this talk, um, yeah, one of the, the critical things for a successful research environment um, are the, uh, the relationships that's, that's formed um, amongst the, uh, the, the people uh, in, the, uh, in the department. Um, so they, they basically, um, Ajawi concludes that you know, research environments or, or cultures are uh, one of the most influential predictors of, uh, of research productivity. And uh, it's the relationships in the form of networks um, that are considered to improve the quality of research um, through uh, improved collaboration. And that researchers, research leaders, and research organizations should prioritize the protection of time for research, enculturate research identities, and develop collaborative re relationships to better foster successful research environments. And so a lot of my um, kind of time and thinking is uh, is spent on on how we can uh, can support our students um, uh, in their socialization as uh, as um, academics and as future academics, um, but integrate them into the department and integrate them within broader networks, research networks, and 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 uh, um, uh, in in the discipline to uh, to support their development as uh, as researchers. 
Um, again, a fairly recent paper. This was from, um, I think this is from the Netherlands, uh, this one, but published 2021. So uh, fairly, um, fairly recent. And, uh, and they were looking at, this is a, a regression um, analysis of, um, again, looking at successful predictors or predictors of successful PhD candidature completion. And um, a, a, again, it's what they found in the regression was that social integration um, it was, uh, was related to completion progress and, uh, and satisfaction. And so those, and, and a key part of that social integration were the formation of these social or informal um, ties and, and socialize, socializing with colleagues and, uh, and, uh, and opportunities to, um, to interact and, uh, and, and discuss, um, um, you know, not just their research, but you know, their, their, their lives and, and how they're getting on with, uh, with, their, uh, with their colleagues. Um, so I'm just uh, just look, just having a quick look at the the chat box and uh, yeah, I, Sharon just popped a thing in there. Uh, long term hard piece of effort. Yep, say that to your kids. Yep, sounds good. Um, so as I said, so 2018, so 2017, 2018, um, I come into uh, Monash University Department of General Practice and. Um, one of the first meetings I had, so in the middle there is uh, Daniel Matzer, who's um, who's our head of department, and uh, the first one of the first things that Daniel tasked me with doing was um, was helping to develop the uh, or put together a plan for a research training culture um, um, within the uh, within the department. And so I went away and I had a bit of a think about it and talked to a number of people and, uh, and come back and uh, talk to Danielle um, about what we want to do with our students. And, um, and I think th this is the approach that we're taking at Monash. Um, but again, I, I think these are really kind of general principles that anyone can take, um, regardless of the department that you're in. Um, and, uh, and, um, uh, and, and I hopefully um, achieve some success um, from it. So the three basic principles that we have is that we, we our research training is that it's on site involved and uh, and contributing and the on site component has obviously been a bit hard the last couple of years um and so but we've transitioned um really well to uh to mostly being an online department actually for the last uh, last 18 months and uh I, we've got a couple of people from my actually sharon for instance is uh is uh is is online a lot of the time um and uh and i think we've we've been been fairly successful in maintaining as much of an on-site fuel as we can, even though people are primarily working online at the moment. But by on-site, what we really mean is, is regular attendance. And uh, attendance is crit critical to success. And uh, you know, just showing up is, uh, is important, but it's important because it provides um, opportunities for networking um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and learning as well. So being part of the, uh, we have a weekly academic, a weekly staff meeting and a weekly academic seminar. And so they're really important kind of learning opportunities, but they're also kind of opportunities to meet different researchers and, and, and help kind of build your networks um, um, with other academics around the department. Um, we also have, but there's a number of quite large research groups in, in the department. And so attendance at research group meetings is really, really important. And we have a fortnightly, um, research group, a uh, graduate research group, GRG stands for graduate research group. And so we have a fortnightly graduate research group meeting for our, um, for our students and, uh, and that's compulsory for um, our academic registrars and, um, and honours students to come along to. And um, it's um, uh, highly recommended for our, our PhD students and, and most of them do come along to that as well. Um, we want our students to be involved. Um, so there's opportunities and, and encouragement for them to contribute to academic discussions at meetings, seminars, uh, morning tea. Um, we have a student representation on department, school and faculty committees, and we really kind of promote those opportunities to our, to our students. And uh, within our department, we have a, um, a, marketing, um, a marketing committee, a social committee and a, and a research committee. And we have student represent representation that, that kind of rotates around uh, all, on all of those committees. And again, it's an opportunity to kind of develop leadership skills, but 
more of more the, the, the bigger kind of purpose of it is to provide a, a opportunities to build kind of social networks and get to know the other researchers and the other academics um, that are in the department and uh, contributing. So the expectation is that um, we're a really collaborative department um, and there's a, uh, and I guess an expectation um, that people are going to share skills and knowledge, um, provide constructive and supportive feedback to others. And uh, we're really trying to create a sense of uh, a sense of community. And all these things are really, really important um, for success um, within PhD, which is the, the focus of, uh, of, of, of my um, teaching at Monash, um, but also for early career researchers as, as well. So just in terms of operationalizing this, um, that's our, our weekly um, academic meeting. This was obviously before COVID. Um, that's our academic um, staff meeting has moved completely online. So we have that over Zoom now. Um, some of our committees, Again, smaller groups of people, it's just a chance for everyone to kind of get to know each other a little bit better, make those kind of informal connections and, um, and, uh, and, and develop kind of friendships and relationships um, across, um, uh, across the different research groups that are, that are in the department. Um, conference attendance, again, really, really important. And that's a big focus of, um, of our professional development um, here at Monash, both staff and students. And, uh, and Danielle is really great at, um, at supporting people to attend conferences. Um, and obviously th there's a cost which, which um, yeah, a cost to attending conferences, um, uh, you know, particularly face-to-face -face conferences are particularly um, costly, but, uh we, uh we we try to kind of encourage our honor students phd students and uh, postdocs to um to attend um where they can and down the, the bottom left here this is our graduate research group um as i said we've been meeting kind of online fortnightly uh through covid and um and again it's it's a combination of opportunities for for learning so we have like guest speakers come in and uh, present usually on the kind of research methods um, but there's lots of opportunities for um, uh, for uh, just just for discussing kind of how you're getting on with your research um, and, uh, and and kind of forming those social relationships and those social bonds with the um, other students um, in the department and um, and look these things, these things here are all really, really kind of important in terms of developing a sense of belonging uh, amongst students and, and you know, providing kind of opportunities and, and uh, providing the time for them to form connections and, uh, and develop their professional identities and, and, and build their, uh, their networks, which will hopefully kind of help them as they progress into, uh, or help them with their research um, in terms of strengthening the, the quality of the research that they do with students but then um, uh, kind of opening up career opportunities as they progress through to, uh, to postdoc or whatever the next, next uh, whatever comes next after the, uh, the, the PhD. Um, again, um, shortly after um, Habiba contacted me about, about giving this talk, um, I was having a little bit of a look through the, uh, the literature and, uh, and this paper from uh, Troy Heffernan um, from La Trobe Uni um, was published at the, uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, and, uh, and, and this was a, um, and it, the title of the paper, as you can see there is Academic Networks and Career Trajectory. Um, there's no career in academia without networks. And so this paper is really interesting. It was, it was actually, it was a qualitative study of 109 academics um, from Australia, New Zealand, US, UK, and Ireland. Um, so it was a it, it was qualitative, but the uh, the, the academics responded to um, or provided mid link written responses to uh, to survey questions. And then he's done a thematic analysis to identify patterns in the lived experience and perspective um, of academics and uh, and how they use their networks uh, in their uh, in their careers. And um, so. A lot of what he found it was fairly consistent with what's already known from the uh, from the, the the literature around the the role that social networks play in uh, career progression, both inside academia but also in um, outside academia as well. Um, and so, you know, basically, the, the the networks that you have, so the size of your network, um, the density of your con of the connections within the network, they're all really important and, and play a direct role in uh, in career success. Um, it, they, they open up employment opportunities, um, but also um, 
um, within um, be, beyond just being aware of career opportunities. Um, and there are a lot of kind of roles and positions um, in academia, which, which um, are either not formally advertised um, or are, um, are kind of directed to, to individuals who have already been tapped on the shoulder to take those roles. And so your networks can kind of open up and, and kind of alert you to those opportunities. But um, you know, a lot of what happens on um, selection panels is that um, is that if you if you know the the say for example if you if you know the work of the supervisor um, of the student who's applied for a, a role in the department, it, it does it shifts your um, perspective of uh, of how that person might fit into the department, um, and, uh, and 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 so the, the networks they have a direct role, but they also have more of an indirect role as well. Um, the other thing which he talks about is how um, networks impact upon publication. Um, and so that's uh, around kind of opportunities to publish and to, uh, to co-author um, papers. And of course, publications during your postdoc, uh, so during, during your doctoral candidature. So just the, 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 the basics, um, number of publications from your PhD candidature, uh, that's predictive of, um, of future publication and, uh, and future academic employment as well. And so having networks and being able to get involved in other people's papers um, is, uh, is, is important for your future su success as well. Same for conference opportunities as well. Um, uh, opportunities to speak and, and present at uh, workshops and webinars like this one. And, uh, and a lot of those come through your, uh, your, your social networks as, as kind of a direct um, a direct kind of relationship between your networks and, uh, and, and those opportunities. But the interesting, interesting thing about, um, about the, the Hefnan paper was that, yeah, that there are all these kind of indirect impacts um, as well. So your networks and, and having strong academic networks um, help position you closer to, to new research trends. Um, you might get earlier access to findings before they're published, which then helps you kind of you know, guide um, research questions that you, that you ask in grant applications. Um, uh, these things apply for both senior and junior members uh, as well. So it's not, it's not just the, the professors and associate professors that, have, that, that tend to have bigger networks that, that are getting, um, um, that are getting um, benefits from, from those networks, but, uh, but, but junior members can access them as well. Um, and, and also, yeah, that there are differences of family and partner obligations also kind of uh, that they shape careers differently. And, um, and uh, yeah, there's some important work around gender and uh, social capital and, and networks, which, I, which I'll talk a little bit about later on um, in particular, um, which, um, which is useful to, to know and, and, uh, and, uh, and understand as well. But the central theme from, um, from, um, from the paper is that there, there's no career in academia without networks. And, uh, and so that's, that, that was part of the, uh, the, the inspiration for, uh, for this, this talk today. So um, what do we mean by social networks and social capital? Um, so I'm not, so again, kind of, we're talking about social networks, not, not talking about social media, not talking about Facebook, Twitter, all that, that LinkedIn, that kind of stuff. Um, we're talking about the relationships between uh, individuals. Um, th th this is something that most of you would have seen somewhere, um, somewhere along the, the, the way through your, uh, through your um, study or, or work so far. It's just a really kind of basic kind of social network map. Um, so in social network analysis, uh, the ego is the uh, the individual that uh, is at the centre of the, um, uh, the 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 study or the analysis, and then they're linked to other people in the network who are called alters or, or sometimes actors, and uh, and the, the ties, um, and and so you can see here that there's a there's a, a structure to the social network as well. So this is a more dense part of the structure with more interrelationships between the alters. And, uh, and, that's, and it's also compartmentalized as well. So these, these relationships here are, are, are separate to these relationships here. And so the, the size and the, um, and the structure of the network are, are, are all important and, and have relationships to things like career outcomes, but yeah, access to social support and uh, social relationships as well. So social network simply defined as the web of social relationships that surround an individual and the characteristics of those ties. So, you know, the strength and the, of these link linkages. 
Um, special interest in within network analysis is the uh, the ties that interlink um, through common nodes, um, which creates chains chains or paths of nodes or links. And um, the the interesting thing about those uh, those links and those pathways is that they um, is is that things like um, you know, goods ideas instructions all, all those things are, can flow through those um those relationships um as, as well as things like you know disease which yeah the time of covid we're, we're all very um very aware of um how uh, how covid spreads within uh, within within networks um so social resources there are a number of kind of theories associated with social networks and how they impact on um, outcomes like career success and and so on and um, so one of those is social resource theory and uh, that argues that an actor's achievement um, is in part a function of the resources that their social network enables them to uh, to gain access to and so whether it's ideas instructions yeah things like that that they all tend to um, to uh, to support career success later on. No. So sorry, Chris. There is a question from Shakira. Oh, so how yep. often do you keep in touch with individuals in your network? Mm. Yeah. So um, I don't think there's any kind of hard and fast rule, um, but um, but I guess like some relationships are stronger um, are stronger than others, and uh, the stronger the and it, it's it's interesting. It's actually it's a really interesting question. Um, so in parts of the network which are which are more dense, so there's more, where there's more interrelationships, the 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 relation the strength for the relationships tend to be stronger, and so you might have more frequent contact perhaps in in here, but the um but but what what the literature kind of tells us is that the um is that the um that the introduction of different ideas, alternative ways of looking at it, actually comes from more diverse networks. Um, and so while the ties might be stronger here, um, there might be a, a greater kind of influx of new ideas from, uh, from more diverse networks. So, um, so Shakira, there's, there's not really a, a right and a wrong answer to that. Um, uh, it, uh, it, it kind of depends on the, the strength of ties within the, relate, within the network um, and, I, and I guess opportunity to, to meet as well. Um, so just just continue on from this this notion that you can um, gain resources um, from within your, your social network. Um, this this kind of heads into the cap into the uh, the territory of of social capital, and social capital can be defined as um, the networks of trust and reciprocity that link multiple individuals together um, within the within the network, and it's that's this social capital. Um, or, or this access to, to tangible and intangible resources, you know, such as information or ideas um, or support that, that are required through direct or indirect contacts um, within the, uh, the social network. Um, in epidemiology, um, social capital is viewed as a combination of patterns of community participation and, uh, and the social cohesion that's created by participation. Um, within those uh, those networks or those those communities, and uh, yeah, social view of social capital emphasizes the importance of socialization, identity formation, and learning in a workforce environment. Uh, le learning in workforce development, and so th there's these kind of concepts again: socialization, identity formation. You know, all of those are really important for success within um, uh, within uh, higher degree programs um, as well. Um, so social capital um, is the, the resource that researchers at universities gain uh, access to through their participation in social networks or, or other social structures. And uh, accumulation of social capital is considered an essential resource for the creation of an academic career and uh, success within it. Now, a lot of this just takes time. Um, it, ju it just takes time to build relationships, um, to, you know, gain access to the networks that uh, that uh, that that will let you accumulate that social capital um, and uh, and uh, yeah and achieve success um, within your career but there is a way that you can um, that, that there there are ways that you can kind of um, shorten that uh, that that time period um, and the, the the main way that uh, that early career researchers and, and PhD students can uh, can do this is through their developmental networks 
And so developmental networks are people that have the other person's best interests regarding their professional and private advancement in mind. And for most PhD students, the, the most important person within their developmental network um, will be their, uh, their PhDs, the, their supervisory team. So either their principal supervisor or the other members of their, their supervisor team. And uh, the, the social capital of developmental networks um, is expressed through career and psychosocial support. And uh, it's been linked to career outcomes, uh, including promotions, career satisfaction, perceived career success and career related um, self, uh, self efficacy. And that the main importance of um, developmental networks um, is that you can borrow the social, borrow the social capital um, of more senior members within that, uh, within that network. And, uh, and that gives you access to groups or individuals that would otherwise be uh, difficult to connect with um, um, otherwise. So one example is when a researcher is invited to a specific research group by an influential or, or sponsoring um, professor. Now, some supervisors are really, really good at, at doing this without too much prodding. Um, and, uh, and other supervisors, um, you, you may need to prod and, and ask them to, to provide you introductions or, or whatever it may be. And uh, yeah, so there's this notion of managing your supervisor. And uh, yeah, and this is one of the ways that you need to manage your supervisor is, is in gaining, gaining access to their, their social capital and uh, through, through their, uh, their networks of, uh, of academics. Um, another example is um, seeking out so actively seeking out national, international networks yourself. And, um, and so groups like FACES, for instance, uh, are again, uh, are one example of a, a national network um, that, that you can uh, gain access to the, the members that are here um, by, uh, by being a part of. And so um, all of you guys are, are doing, doing that, um, maybe not consciously, um, but, uh, but that's one example of, of um, gaining access to, to a broader network and the social capital that, that's, uh, that, that comes with that, that broader network. So supervisors and mentors. Um, so the supervisor role is, is central to your, your developmental network. And you know, that's true for PhD students and, uh, and early career researchers, postdocs um, as well. Um, I won't talk, talk much more about the role of supervisors. I need to say that they are um, really, really important. Um, and the relationship with your PhD supervisor is, uh, is something that, that you really need to kind of work at um, developing. Um, and uh, um, when I was uh, uh, in that, that chair of, of high degrees role at, uh, at Flinders, a lot of my time was spent dealing with, um, with uh, supervisor student relationships that had broken down. And, uh, and that's, that's one of the, the, the major ways that, um, that uh, PhDs go off track is when that supervisor student relationship um, breaks down. Um, but I just want to kind of touch on the role of mentors um, for a little, for a, for a moment. Um, mentors are another way of, of increasing your, your developmental network. Um, and yeah, there's an important distinction um, between supervisors and, uh, and mentors. Um, so your supervisor, and so this comes from an American paper um, and they tend to use the, the term advisor rather than supervisor, whereas supervisor is what we'd, what we'd use in Australia. But so the supervisor's job is to provide information on degree requirements and guidance on how to navigate the system. So it's really kind of focused on, um, yeah, on helping you get the PhD completed. Whereas a mentor has a, uh, has a, can have a much broader role. Um, so they might be seen as a role model and uh, someone the student wants to emulate um, professionally. And, uh, and again, you, you're able to access your, so your mentor, you're able to access their developmental networks and, uh, and gain social capital through their, uh, through their networks. So mentoring is really important. Um, this, um, this comes from a paper from Jody Oliver Baxter and Company. It's a Flinders paper. We've been talking about Flinders quite a lot today. Um, but uh, so Jody was a she was she was a Picris research fellow at Picris, and um, and uh, and she did a uh, study looking at um, uh, I think the paper was yeah. So the paper was surviving or thriving in primary healthcare research, and it was looking at um, at factors that predicted whether people um, stayed in primary healthcare research or whether they left primary healthcare research. And mentoring was one of the things that was important for, for staying. Um, and, uh, but, uh, um, 
but uh, and I haven't got the percent. Have I got? I haven't got the. Uh, yeah, and so um, only eleven people in the study um, had a mentor. Um, so the majority, so two thirds, didn't have a mentor, um, but the the most people would like a mentor. And um, and again, I, I think this is a way of kind of building your networks, um, helping you kind of get engaged and and accessing these developmental networks and the social capital of the mentor um, or of others within your developmental network. Um, mentoring is a is a really useful way of uh, of going about that in a bit bit of a structured way and and would really encourage everyone to uh to seek mentorship um beyond their supervisor um uh, i was so one of my mentors um was uh is or was sorry um professor uh, john covney and um and so he mentored me for a few years uh back particularly um when i was moving from a uh, lecturer and I was, I was wanting to apply for promotion through the senior lecturer and uh, and he was really quite instrumental in uh, in, in helping me kind of um you know, build my cv to uh, to let me kind of get over the line um to uh to, to gain the promotion from lecturer to, to senior lecturer and um and yeah just one way that that you know kind of having someone like like john as a as a mentor kind of he kind of you know, open up new opportunities, which I, which I haven't even kind of thought about beforehand and, and probably wouldn't have had access to um, without him as a, as a mentor, um, was through the, uh, the Public Health Association um, uh, SA branch. And, uh, and John alerted me to the fact that, um, that there was um, uh, opening for a, mem for a new member uh, on the, uh, the executive committee of the, uh, the PHA South Australian branch and, uh, and encouraged me to put in my application um for a uh, for a for a position and, and i was on the phaa sa branch exec for for several years and um and it was really a fantastic experience um and one of the things that i that i was able to do um was that uh, i was part of the uh the uh, the state conference organizing committee and then for a couple of years there um, I, I chaired the uh, the state conference scientific um, review committee, um, and th that was just a, a terrific kind of set of skills um, that I was able to kind of develop from um, from my involvement with that that committee, um, which I wouldn't have otherwise been able to have, um, and uh, and proved very useful actually for Triple APC. Um, so for the last few years, I've been involved with the Triple APC. Um, annual research conference and so a lot of the skills that I and lessons I learned from being part of the uh, PHAA conference I was able to apply in in making the triple APC conference um, such a, a success. Um, so positive academic relationships characterized by mutual trust and respect um, whereas others describe them as friendships and I, I think that the thing I really want to kind of you know, make from from this slide is that, that they take time to develop. Um, so you know, over time, your networks develop. That the people that you meet, um, you know, the the number increases. But um, but you really kind of want to want to want to kind of identify those people that you're that you enjoy working with. And um, yeah, if you can sit down at a coffee at a, at a cafe and enjoy a coffee with with your with your um, colleagues and and peers, then um, then I, I think that's that's a, a really good way of kind of identifying the, the types of people that you want in your uh, in your academic networks. Um, the other way to grow your networks is by serving on committees, and um, and that's a great way to meet uh, academics, researchers, and policymakers from from outside your um, academic department and your usual sphere of contacts. Um, this is the National Research Evaluation and Ethics Committee uh, membership. Um, um, and uh, so I was involved with that for several years. Um, Teng Lu's the, the chairperson, but um, one of the, the, the terrific things about this committee was that um, at the end of the year, we would uh, meet in person at the RACGP offices in Sydney. And uh, the, the, uh, the RACGP offices, they, they actually, they're in North Sydney and they overlook the Sydney Harbour Bridge and the, the conference room, um, it, it literally looks over the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And at night time when we would meet, yeah, it, it was just impossible to concentrate on work because you're looking at this, this beautiful view over the harbour. Um, but um, one of the great things about that, uh, that, that meeting was that afterwards we would go out for dinner um, at a uh, 
at uh, one of the local kind of uh, hotels um, down the uh, down the road from the, the RACGP offices, and uh, and that was just a, a terrific way to get to know the other members on the committee and and you know, understand them a bit better. And um, and look, I, I often call on a number of these people. We've we've been involved in in papers, have written several papers together now, um, and. Uh, the, the AAA PC, the, the registrars here who are part of the academic post program would, would recognize Michael Tam. So I get him to come along and, and talk about uh, ethics at, uh, at, at those meetings. And we've got Rowena coming um, uh, next year for next year's group. She's going to talk about ethics um, for the, uh, the, the new group. And again, it is through that, 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 that those conversations over dinner that I feel comfortable and confident that um, about contacting you know, people like Michael and Rowena and, and Sally and asking them to, um, and, and I'm confident that when they come and present to you guys, or if you're going to write papers together, that it's going to be really good quality um, uh, uh, stuff that they uh, that they bring. So, um, thinking about yourselves um, and the opportunities to build your networks within Australia. Um, so, AAA PC. So, you guys are in the right place. AAA PC is absolutely fantastic at this kind of stuff. And uh, the, the AAA PC conference, um, you know, barring the, the conflict of interest that I, I was part of the organizing committee, but um, yeah, I, there's a real, there was, even though last couple of years we were online, we had a real focus on providing opportunities for networking, um, workshops for people to get to meet each other. And, and those things are, are really, really important in terms of building um, building um, primary care and, and strengthening primary care research um, in Australia. And being part of phases is a great opportunity for you guys. And, uh, and again, really glad that AAA PC has been able to um, support phases and, uh, and continue going. Um, PHAA, um, so they've got a primary healthcare special interest group, which was really good to be a part of. I'm not part of it anymore, but I was for many years and that, that was really, really good. Um, RACGP, GP conference, GP21 has a bit more of a clinical focus usually rather than a re research focus. Um, but again, if you can get along to that, um, that's a great way to meet particularly other GPs. And um, for our GP registrars who do an academic post um, or for the GP registrars doing an academic post, again, is a great way to, uh, to, um, uh, to meet other people interested in research. And, uh, and this is the academic post group from, uh, a, from last year. Oh, Habiba, are you in? No, you're not in this group. You're in this year's group, aren't you? Yeah, this is from last. So this was in Sydney. Um, this, the, the, Sydney was covered in bushfire smoke. So we, we couldn't leave the building because it, it was literally too dangerous to leave the building. Um, but we had a, a, a great time um, uh, thinking about research and getting to know each other um, at, that, um, at that meeting. So look, I'm going to... Um, give you guys a, a quick chance to um, to share your knowledge amongst the um, the group here. And um, if you just scroll to the, the top of your screen, you should be able to see an annotate button. And I just, if you just want to click on that and you can add in it, you can you can make comments in here. And I just wonder if people might want to um, add in, if, if you know of any kind of networking groups or if there's a really good conference that you've been to that, that other people might want to look at in the future. You know, are, are there other opportunities um, for networking within Australia um, that you know of that, that you could let other people know about or that have been really useful for you. And maybe if you want to come off mute and, and, and talk about why it was really good or, or why you might like to get involved, feel free to um, as, as well. Oh, yep, GP's down in the Facebook group. Yeah, that's a good one. Yep. Chris, it's Hester here. Oh, hey, um, Hester. How are you going? Hi. Good, good. Um, look, I have to say my experience of trying to present research at the RECGP conference, it really was not mm. a good experience. Um, yep. So presenting papers to two of my mates and a pigeon. <laughs> um, so I don't know if people have had a different experience, but I, I guess when I yep. saw that, I went, Mm, it's much more mm. clinically focused mm. um, and there's, there didn't seem to be much interest in uh, the opportunity to to um, talk about research or to connect around research. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's been identified um, or, or been mentioned to RACGP um, 
and uh, that the, the, they they are, they do try to strengthen the, the research component, but uh, but yeah, but that's that's feedback that I've heard before. Um, PC four is a, another one. I think they're based they're, they're part of Uni Melbourne, um, aren't they? But uh, again, they're a really good really good collaborative group um, as well. HSR is that Health Services Research Conference? Not sure who posted that. Yeah, that's right. It's a Health Services Research Association of Australia, New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, how do I get rid of this? How do I get rid of the annotations? Uh, can I clear? Oh, there we go. All right. Um, I just realized time's kind of ticking on. Um, internationally, uh, again, uh, there are a number, a couple of really good international com uh, international opportunities, networking opportunities that, uh, that I'd like to make you aware of. Uh, one is the Oxford International Primary Care Research Leadership Program. Uh, so that runs out of Oxford. And um, that's that's a terrific one if you can get, uh, if you can get the funding to attend it, it's it's not cheap, um, but usually you can um, you, you you need to try to convince your department to to pay for you to to attend that. Um, the other one is Tudor PHC, uh, which is based in Canada, and um, and that's uh, one that we send one of our research fellows to each year. And the feedback for the last few years has been been really fantastic. Um, so down the bottom there is Sir Joel, who's a PhD student in our department, and uh, and he really enjoyed it. And we've got someone this year as well. Um, I did the Oxford one a few years ago, and um, this is my cohort uh, of people. And, and again, we we still collaborate um, either individually or as a group. We've written a couple of papers, um, and uh, um, and often call on them to uh, to be involved in in uh, different things, examining theses, um, grant applications, that, that kind of thing. Um, again, one of the things that makes it made it so successful. Um, is that we had lots of opportunities for um, getting to know each other uh, on a more personal level, and and you know, as a bit of a, 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 a kind of a, a nerd growing up, you know, I have to say there's nothing cooler than playing pool in the keg room of the buttery at, at Worcester College with um, with uh, academics from uh, from the UK. Um, so how much more time have we got? Uh, that's about time, actually, Chris. Okay, I'll, I'll just quickly, quickly skip through. Sorry, I've yeah. been enjoying myself talking too much. That's right. Um, yeah, network's really important for well-being. Um, again, just the human relationships are, are critical. Um, we know that mental health is is really is a big problem for um, PhD students. Um, it's also really challenging for postdocs, and um, but yeah. Getting along to um, you know, things like dinners and morning teas, and you know, engaging with your peers and your fellow students um, uh, is is a really good way to break down that isolation that comes from doing a, a PhD, um, and uh, and and help. Um, and those social relationships can kind of help help through um, that. Um, I won't. I won't talk about that. Just uh, another thing. Um, impact uh, networks incredibly important for impact, um, and uh, and so think about your stakeholders um, who you, you want to uh, to impact. Um, you want your research to impact, and uh, and think about how you can connect with them um, as well. Um, just in terms of barriers to social networks and social capital, you know, there, there are issues around income. You know, social economic status, gender, race, gender inequalities really um, ha have been investigated quite a lot, um, and uh, and and the, the social networks of men and women, um, academics, male and female academics tend to be um, different, and they use them differently. Um, men tend to borrow social capital more through vertical networks, um, whereas women tend to have more horizontal networks, which is great for social support, but not so great for career progression. And disruptions to social organisation, social relationships, um, highly destructive to social capital, and you know, of course, it's been a, a huge kind of issue with um, COVID and uh, and working from working from home. Um, I, I yeah, I look, I, I don't think I need to say much about COVID and working from home, but um, a few opportunities to build social capital. Um, 
loneliness, isolation, feeling more siloed, um, all of these really uh, important things which, um, which impact on productivity and, uh, um, and, and well-being. And, uh, and at an organisational level, we need to try to uh, enable kind of make space for connections, um, encourage and reward social support and, and um, improve structure of meetings so that we can continue to facilitate um, human, relationship, human relationships. Um, it's just a, a final kind of word, uh, human relationships. Um, tend to be the, the ones that have the greatest influence over success in, in college. This is for US uh, undergraduate, US um, college students. But again, I think it's pretty uh, relevant for postgrad students and, and it's also for early career researchers as well. And so I'll leave you with a reflection activity um, to have a think about. Um, think about how strong and diverse is, is your network? Uh, how much trust do you have with the different people within your network? And, uh, and how can you be strategic about cultivating your networks and, uh, and accumulating your, your social capital you know, to help with career progression and help with your research, uh, but also to help um, manage the stresses of, of being a, a student and, a, and an academic and an early career research, researcher in, uh, in the university system and uh, an academic primary care. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Habiba. Thanks, Chris. That was excellent talk and left us with a lot of good information how we can progress through our career. And thanks for joining everyone. And I have left an evaluation form. I'd also send it by email. And do you have any other question for Chris? All good then. Thanks for taking your time, Chris. See ya, I'll end it. Bye. Thanks, Habiba. See ya.